This is a production of Cornell University. Yep. Th thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, this is the 14th episode of the Cornell Turf Show this year, our third season. Uh, today's guest is a guest we had on in our first season, Dr. Cal, Cal Bigelow of Purdue. Uh, you may know him, Dr. Big, on Twitter. You can follow him there. Uh, we'll get to a conversation later with Cal. I'm sure we'll talk about uh, irrigation, turf grass nutrition. We've talked about growth rates in the past of lawn turf. Uh, so Frank will have some surprises there, uh, I'm sure. Uh, but as always, Frank, uh, I'll let you get us started today and, and oh, see what's going on in the, uh, the weather world here. Let me get the right page. Uh, and we've got some curveballs, I think, for Dr. Bigelow today. We okay. want to keep him on his toes. You know, he's got those young people that he's training. So uh, thank everybody for joining us. Uh, welcome, whether you're live or um, on the podcast or watching the video uh, this is the fastest 30 minutes in turf, our lawn and grounds edition. Got this great picture from somewhere out west where these sticks of artificial corn are sticking up and a dandelion. Uh, I think that's Ohio. Uh, is it Ohio? Okay, right. So you must have seen this. It is, it must, I know it's in the Midwest somewhere. So that's, uh, it, it's, uh, I, I was struck by, uh, I love uh, lawn art and things out in the landscape, but this poor guy, tweeted this out uh, after 15 years. <laughs> I wonder if there were signs that this thing was failing, but you gotta, you know, here's what I love. You gotta love, oh, wait a second. Let me get the pen. You gotta love the golf ball on the height adjuster, right? Right, M making it effective, right? You, you gotta like that ingenuity of this guy. All right, Carl, what's the stat of the day today? I can't wait to hear what this is. Yeah, so uh, it used to be a show, Frank. I think it was on ESPN. It was pros versus Joes, and it was pro athletes versus just kind of every guy, everyday guys off the street. Uh, and, and looked at some uh, some data here out of Ohio State, and they compared basically three lawn uh, lawn care regiments. They looked at lawns that were maintained by uh, landscaping professionals, uh, DIYers, do-it-yourselfers who would go and follow um, kind of a retail brand uh, program for their lawn. And then uh, kind of lazy homeowners who just mow, no other inputs, just mowing. And they looked at stuff like uh, weed invasion and turf grass quality. And, and for those who can see up in the top right, turf grass quality, no surprise, was highest with the professional uh, management program uh, and significantly lower with both the DIYers and the no input program. Uh, but interestingly, there was no difference between the, the DIYers who had, uh, who were applying fertilizer or herbicides and the no input folks. Um, and actually you could also see another graph down there on the bottom, uh, more weed incidents, uh, of course, with the, the, DI, the no input folks, but also DIYers actually had more uh, ground ivy, uh, about the same broadleaf plantain as uh, the no input one. So we see the pros win, uh, not, not surprisingly, the pros win, uh, but also the lazy Joes win. So, it, you know, this was back in the mid 2000s, maybe our our DIY lawn owners weren't weren't uh, as good at maintaining their lawns back then. Maybe they're better now, um, but but we saw back then certainly that the, if you if you were going to maintain it yourself, just mow it. There, there, there's no reason to to apply. So just an interesting study. <clears throat> and again, this is in Ohio, but uh, some interesting uh, an interesting look. Yeah, in there. and I know Carl, you you do a fair amount yourself uh, as the lazy Joe, uh, no input. Although you are ramping it up a little bit with the kid. Uh, and a dog, right? You're, you're a, a dog will put a little... dent in your plans really quick. Then, then it's hard to uh, maintain turf, turf cover with a, a terrier running around. So that's what I was going to say. Does no input in, include, uh, you know, ravaged by dogs and kids? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good question. They'll have to take that data next time. Dogs per household. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's get to the roller coaster that is the weather. Uh, and I know Kale's been dealing with this out in the Midwest as well. You can see the up and down, and we're getting close to highs one week and close to lows, uh, record highs one week, record lows the next week. So this fluctuating up and down, Cal, I just love that you keep taking these same pictures from the same place. Where is this on the Purdue campus? So that is the uh, Purdue Mall. That's the central focal point. Uh, they're right in the center of campus and, you know, sort of intersection of lots of things. So it's multi-purpose and it, it gives me uh, probably a little bit like you, if you're actually paying attention, you know, I like to go back at the end of the year and just kind of see how things have, you know, ups and downs. It's good to know, right? Right. And, and early on, you've had this ups and downs, right? You, you, you know, warmed up out of the gate, got going. Obviously, you already had traffic on it. 
I guess everybody's glad it wasn't the 18th on the 11th, right? When all the tents were out there, but right. So that was that was Spring Fest, right? That was the weekend of Spring Fest, um, and the, the the Turf Bug Bowl or the Bug Bowl that they have. And oh, good. Etymology's Bug Bowl was part of that cricket spitting and everything. So, <laughs> well, this okay. I'm going to leave that there, Cal, and I'm going to go with science here on the fall <laughs> spring. Right. Uh, one of the things that we're starting to see uh, is this uh, release uh, of dormancy and then uh, subsequent cold temperatures, release of dormancy uh, and subsequent cold temperatures. And I'm sure you're aware that the folks in Minnesota have been playing around with this, particularly with the increase in tall fescue uh, that's getting used up there. And I know, Cal, you've been playing around quite a bit more with tall fescue and certainly water use and mowing and nutrition. But from this perspective, the fall spring on the tall fescue, let me ask you right out of the gate. Um, are you seeing these fluctuating temperatures in the spring uh, cause problems to some of these two tall fescue? I mean, obviously you probably got some Kentucky bluegrass there a little bit too, but way more tall fescue. Are you seeing this fluctuating temperature impact on any of your variety trials, for example? It's it's pretty mixed. I think from year to year, it's not very consistent, but um, there have been times in recent years that for whatever reason, uh, we've had some things that have been planted the previous fall and you sort of get that roller coaster. And there's there's a few things that uh, even from trials that were planted last year, uh, that, that things are not greening up like we hoped. So uh, there is a potential impact there. Okay, and you're talking about new establishments, not mature establishments. Yeah, I, th I think once you get past that first year, you're probably in the clear. But I think that things that were established in, even in September of last year, we've seen some potential issues this year with just this past week going out and looking at some, you know, some green up ratings on some trials mm -hmm. we planted last year, mm -hmm. uh, that there's some stuff I don't know if it's going to make it. And that's a little concerning. That's, that's very, and, and oh boy, <laughs> that's always, always are always fun. All right, let's get to the weather a little bit. Obviously, uh, it was a little cooler than normal, sort of to the east, uh, New England, and a slightly warmer than normal with Buffalo uh, winning the day, uh, the Western New York area winning the day for warmer than normal, uh, just about two, four to six degrees. And of course, growing degree, growing degree day accumulation, base 50 anyway, all of them, no matter whether it's 22, 50, 55, 32, whatever, they're accumulating. And obviously the 50 base uh, growing degree days are not accumulating that rapidly uh, over the last week. Now, the outlook is uh, probably mostly below average now when you look at the six to 10 day. But in the immediate time frame, you're seeing very, again, very low accumulation of degree days, even really maxing out in the metro New York area in the 30 to 40 range. So we're still not accumulating them uh, this far north uh, as much as they are, obviously, as you get further south. We're still about, looks like about a week to two weeks behind normal, about three weeks behind last year, which I thought was interesting uh, from our climate person yesterday. So um, it's also been one of the first times I can remember we've been starting to dry. So rainfall has been fairly light uh, across the region. And what is starting to happen is as the sun gets higher in the sky, we're starting to get more drying, right? So quite a bit more evapotranspiration, drying out the system so that, you know, a half an inch of rain um, may not always uh, last you as long as the sun starts to come up in the sky. So you should start to see the first signs, particularly on poor soils, soils that don't hold a lot of water or very compacted, you should start to see signs uh, of, of a little bit of stress uh, in those areas where soils are not good and the turf is weak going in. Now, the forecast uh, is again giving you that indication that it's going to be slightly nor, you know, slightly dry. Uh, we're not going to see an increase in soil moisture, but it looks like long term, six to 10 day anyway, that we're in for a little bit more moisture uh, across the Northeastern US. Now, when you get into the soil, this soils have tracked. 
very similarly to the roller coaster of the air temperatures, right? So you can look at our highest elevations and you can be in the 40s and you go to the metropolitan New York area, you might even be starting to creep into the upper 50s down into Atlantic City, you might even get into the 60s at the two inch depth. But we're also heading into another cold spell over the next few days. So you'll want to track this. Now, if you're tracking soil temperature for different reasons, one of the primary reasons we do in the lawn environment, I think, uh, where we're not spraying fungicides, is monitoring for crabgrass germination, right? Stilt grass, as we've talked about before, Matt Elmore at Rutgers made us aware it's already up. Crabgrass will be the next one in line. Not far behind that will be goosegrass, right? So we're going to start tracking crabgrass and goosegrass uh, emergence. And I haven't heard yet of too much emergence in the Northeast, yet the phenological indicators are certainly suggesting from a forsythia perspective that crabgrass would be germinating. But when you look at the prediction of crabgrass germination using these base 50 degree day models, and kale was probably around, uh, uh, I don't think was, I don't know, did Peter Noden do any of this stuff? Did he do, he did crabgrass prediction with Fidanza, didn't he Kale? were you Correct. there then? Yeah, he did, that was, um, that was before me, but so that would have been early 90s. Yeah, I forget how young you are still, Cal. You're still, still, still young compared to myself and Fidanza. He might even be older than me, the old frisky fairy ring. We had him on, was it last week, Carl, we had Mike on? Yeah. He's, yeah. He, he's sipping cappuccinos in Italy this week. I know. Who's got a better gig than that guy? All right, so crabgrass is germinating, right? Slow but sure. And yeah. you can see that over the next several days, we're not going to see very much. So just a reminder. For everybody that's running out to do their pre-emergent control, right? You are from right now looking at a, a 14 to 16 week season for crabgrass control, right? I think that's pretty much what we're going to see for how much prevention you're going to need. More so uh, for goosegrass, right? Uh, you're going to need longer control for goosegrass. Goosegrass germinating in, in mid-August can still produce viable seed. Uh, before the end of the year. So pre-emergent weed control, when you look at this chart, you can see everybody's pretty good in the four to six week uh, range. But once you get into um, larger, uh, longer periods of time where you want 12 to 15 weeks, right? Now, Bensalide is not as good. Uh, team is not as good, right? Benefin trifluralin, you want to watch out. Hopefully you're not using too many of those products that you're going with the more longer lasting products. Now, the other thing you'll notice is you get a little bit of annual bluegrass suppression. You get a little bit of broadleaf uh, weed suppression as well. But the key to this is keeping the barrier in place, right? The pre-emergent barrier in place during that spring, you know, length of the season. Now, you know, as the earth is warming, it's getting harder and harder uh, to control these weeds. There's new ones evading these practices, right? Stiltgrass is coming up earlier, goosegrass coming up later, goosegrass avoids dithiopyr. We don't use as much, much Ronstar up here, so we're starting to get uh, goosegrass problems. All of these things conspire to want to make sure you can get a really good timing of these pre-emergent products. Now, we also know in the commercial lawn and landscape institutional grounds business, it's not always easy to, to do uh, ideal timing, right? To get it down, because you got to get the work done within the raindrops, uh, within the, the driving, within the all the other things you have to do in the spring. Getting these things down is not always easy to do. So keep in mind, being strategic, uh, monitoring when they could be germinating. And even if you wait, till you see a little germination, if you're gonna use dimension, especially if you're gonna liquid apply it, you can knock back some of those uh, early posts, those early staged uh, crabgrass plants and still get good pre-emergent control. Now, the other thing that's happening in the lawns in the Northeast is they're really starting to flower right now, right? And when you look at this relative flowering time, you know, I don't know how much I love this particular graph, but it is a good, at least partial indicator that there are weeds in flower, right? And one of the things that's important about that is if you're going out with your grub control, if you're going out with your herbicide applications, 
and you're trying to marry this idea of, you know, of pollinator lawn with, I don't want grubs or a pollinator lawn with, I, I still want to spray these weeds out. That gets really tricky when you get into these situations. But the rule of thumb is simply, if you're going to apply any pesticide or any product to a lawn, be sure to remove those flowers. If the lawn has flowers in it, be sure to remove them prior to any application. Now, if you're more interested in controlling them, we certainly, and I know Purdue has a good one. We've got one, lots of good weed ID, grass ID guides out there. Um, very simple ways to get these things identified. Kale, this is a picture you tweeted earlier uh, about dandelion control. Now, this is my next question for you. You know, this model for dandelion control came out of Purdue, I think before even you and I were born back in the Throssel Riker days when, you know, before dirt was invented uh, back in Purdue. Uh, do you still use this? Is this something that your industry uses? And in your sense, does it work for more than just dandelion? You know, that, that's, a, that's a good question. I don't know how widely it's adopted. Uh, I would say that some of the more astute lawn care operators are probably paying a little bit of attention to this. And, you know, there certainly are some price points on these products on the shelves. I think, you know, one is a, almost probably twice as much as the other. Uh, you know, out our way, there are still a number of folks that are uh, dealing with the, um, you know, the ground ivies and the wild violets and still chasing that. And, and that maybe is coming into some of this conversation, you know, as far as esters versus amines. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, beyond, you know, having, having that conversation and taking it to the point that you're looking at it on this basis, mm -hmm. I think it's probably pretty limited unless it's somebody that's really got their programs dialed in or has a specific need because they're having, you know, a history of a problem. And, and of course, this was developed because we knew people weren't making applications in the fall and they wanted to figure out a way to at least give them some target in the spring. So I do think you're right. I, I think what we talk about all the time with any of these models is they're really good reference points. I mean, I, I like looking at them to just say, well, this thing says I'm, you know, if I'm in central New York, I, I'm still a, a two weeks away from having to apply based on this. At the same time, uh, what I see in the field might indicate maybe it's time for me to go based on my previous experience. Now, when we start to talk about uh, weeds in the lawn, uh, we've been having some very interesting conversations over the last couple of weeks with our extension staff as No Mo May has come around and um, changing the name of weeds to incidental flowering plants. I think that's uh, gonna get a lot of people interested. And of course the University of Minnesota, and I know Kale, you guys have played around with this as well at Purdue, looking at different ways of thinking about uh, vegetation that's closely cut or maybe allowed to go to a meadow. Uh, and I think uh, we've seen just this morning, this is what's got me going, uh, just this morning, the BBC put out a, a very interesting article here on why lawns may have had their day. And I would say these things are pretty much on time. Uh, this is a time when uh, Google Analytics indicates people are searching things for lawns and soils, weeds and seed. So we know that they're with the data we collect on how people search. This is a popular time. And so people who have uh, media outlets like to write these things. This happens to be, I actually like this one. And this one was uh, really interesting as well, not maybe as applicable to us here in the Northeast, because it seems like we can't shut the darn water off. But Kale, I know that you have very much uh, gotten more involved in this thing. So as we start to think about various types of lawn, we've been trying to, we've been efforting to get Professor Bill Miller here uh, to talk about his uh, lawn plantings of these bulbs. Now, daffodil is not a good example because it's not really a, a pollinator friendly uh, bulb, but there certainly are many pollinator friendly bulbs. This is interestingly, he's testing different densities. This is about five per square foot. And you can see these different densities uh, of these little daffodils that he's planting. So you've got the high density all the way down to the low density. But what I'm suggesting is we're beginning to think about the lawn differently. But at the same time, Cal, and this is where you come in, brother, 
um, you know, NCAP trials. Uh, this is some of Kevin Frank's uh, spring Kentucky bluegrass greening up. I know you uh, do this a lot uh, out, out at West Lafayette. And, and so as we bring you in, let me start with that question, Kale. When you think about that early spring stuff, now obviously early spring for you might even be March and February compared to a little later for us up here. What are you thinking about? What kinds of, you know, can you say with any confidence a bluegrass greens up better than a tall fescue, greens up better than a ryegrass? Or is it varietal differences that uh, a good tall fescue can be as good as a good bluegrass for spring green up. I'm really interested in that particular stuff because I know you've taken tons of data on this. Just some general thoughts on what yeah, you're thinking so, about so spring green Just, you know, some general thoughts from, you know, my, my time here with, you know, a couple iterations of, you know, all the species at this point. Mm -hmm. um, I think the thing that we, we, we definitely will see is, you know, if you had to rank those and, and using a broad brush here, mm -hmm, broad uh, brush. running ryegrass is usually first out of the gate. Okay, but you know that can be good and bad because we can also go back to the whole, uh, you know, crown hydration issues, and and you could potentially lose some ryegrasses, right? I mean, any bluegrass and ryegrass, those tend to be the ones that start taking up water first. Mm -hmm. um, so from a you know consumer side of things and retail mixes, I it, it starts to create a little bit of a compelling case of why you know our friends are putting those into the, those ryegrasses into the retail mixes. And I think that ban for the ryegrasses is probably pretty narrow. There's some varietal differences, right? Mm -hmm. uh, among the tall fescues, I'm seeing some that are a little bit better in terms of that spring green up, but still they're, they're a step behind the ryegrasses. And then with the bluegrasses, that band is pretty wide. You know, we've got whatever, we just rated bluegrasses yesterday and there's 90 in the most recent trial that's about to expire. We'll mm -hmm. be getting another one here in about two years. Mm -hmm. But within those, you know, those midnight types, you know, that are traditionally found in a lot of seed mixtures, those still are the, the laggards, right? I mean, those are the ones that they're going to do what they're going to do when they're going to do it. I mean, they're almost as bad as oyster grass. Uh, but there are some other ones that do come out of the gate pretty fast as far as, as spring green up. But if, if you, if spring green up was really important to you and bluegrass was really important to you, I would do my homework if you wanted early color. And I think of our friends that are managing major league baseball parks, right? I mean, they first week of April, you know, if you're in Toledo or, you know, wherever it is, even in Chicago, you know, unless you've got grow blankets or something else, some of those bluegrasses might just lay there. So, yeah. And, 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 you know, part of my motivation for, for sort of approaching it this way is when we think about lawn alternatives and people think about what they don't like about lawns, at the end of the day, what almost everybody is looking for is some like in behind me and behind you and behind Carl, yeah. something that's uniformly green. Uh, and I think like Carl said in the pros versus Joe section that most people, if they cut it and when they cut it from the curb, it looks like a, if they can stripe it even more so if they can stripe it, I don't think most people care if it's green. And I worry sometimes we're, you know, even, you know, grounds operations, want to get good for graduation or get good for uh, a particular event, they'll put nitrogen, they'll put iron. Uh, have you seen any, and I'm trying to avoid that, maybe iron's okay, but I don't want to put nitrogen on early. What do you guys do? Do you see your lawn care industry going out and making those early season applications to get it down and get it done because it works that way? Or are you See, and maybe we're getting better varieties greening up and not needing as much input. I, I think we're going to have to change that culturally, right? I think I think that there's still, you know, a lot of uh, pros, Joes, or Chucks and Trucks that are that are still <laughs> programmatic um, and maybe are not as as careful with those with those early season nitrogen applications, and, and that that concerns me. And I I think maybe the the tune will change this year based on nitrogen prices, you know, compared to what they were a year or two years ago. These these folks maybe are going back to their accountants and taking a little closer look at that. But uh, those early season nitrogen applications, you know, if you've got a midnight Kentucky bluegrass, like I said, it's going to do what it's going to do when it's going to do it, and it's all based on soil temperature. And going out there and juicing it with a half a pound and coming back another two weeks with another half a pound. That's, that's ill-advised from my standpoint, because then you get the grass factory, right? When it does green up, it's a mowing situation, and then it's clippings, and it's 
it's not pleasant, right? So, you know, as we as we start to wrap up already, you know, we weren't lying. It was the fastest 30 minutes. As we start to wrap up, um, I know you've played around with lawn alternatives. I'm not going to ask you any specifics. I mean, do you think we're going to get any traction? We're going to get these crappy articles. Lawns are bad. What is your sense of traction that any lawn alternative could potentially get? Like clover, uh, like in, in, in like... our lifetime, something will happen. In our lifetime, something will happen. And and one of the things that was compelling from one of the studies that Kevin Morris had put together, I think it was 2015, 2016, it was that low maintenance one. And we had included a yarrow in there. And the yarrow was actually very interesting. And I know that Paul Johnson in Utah had some interesting results at six inches of rain a year. And you know, is is that would take some tweaking to include that in there, but under dry, dry conditions like you're experiencing in the Northeast and we're getting more in the Midwest where you're getting these dry summers. And if we got to ratchet off the water, maybe we need some other things, but I, I do think some alternatives are coming. I, I, I agree. And, you know, Tom Cook talks a lot about Yarrow in his uh, original conceptualizing the eco lawn. Like what was the, what's the, like if you're a Joe or a Chuck in a truck, right. like Carl was saying, you guys are saying, and all you're doing is mowing, what is the climax vegetation in a lawn in your eco region, right? What is the mix of plants that will establish themselves? Now I'll say this, the only thing I tell people, it's like, look, you don't want a lawn, it's no problem with me. You want weeds, it's no problem with me. You don't want annual weeds. I don't want bare ground. I want something that stabilizes when, the soil, right? You want something exactly that right. stabilizes that soil. That's right. And, and, you know, seeding in different varieties or even putting in flowering plants. You know, Doug was uh, sold that was here a couple of weeks ago. And we talked about uh, no mow May. And he's like, no, nah, that's bad. Mow high May, June, July. That way, maybe if there's flowers in there, they'll survive underneath. It's not just a one month thing. It's a many month thing. Um, clover is the easy one. Do you like clover in your mixes? Have you guys, as Kevin and the NTEP guys thought more about playing around with these mixtures in an NTEP situation? We, in that one study I just mentioned, there were a few of those for whatever reason at our site, you know, whether it was some winter kill or some other pathogen that maybe came in, the, the clover populations dissipated more than I expected. You know, when you try, it's like any weed, when you try and cultivate the weed, it doesn't want to do it. And, you know, <laughs> that's exactly right. um, the, the one plant that's been kind of compelling to me um, has been the wild violet. You know, wild violet uh, in some of the mature lawns around our, 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 our city here, you know, it, it never gets very tall, no. right? And it flowers for a little while. And then you kind of, it kind of disappears. And, you know, that, that, that early spring interest is of, 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 of note. I don't know what it does in terms of the, the pollinators and everything, but um, that maybe would be something that has some potential. Well, for... and it's, and it's a bear to control. It's not yes. it's like, you got to like put the, the jug of triclopyr on it to control it. Sometimes, right. So listen, Carl, we're at the witching hour here. Uh -oh. uh, questions <laughs> or comments? Yeah. So I got an overall comment. If, if I'm looking at this, like, uh, like a landscaper, right. And, and you guys are telling me, Hey, we, we got to mow less, we got to apply less, and, and I've got a business model I got to keep. Um, I wonder if either of you guys have seen something like uh, an IPM program offering from a landscaper where maybe the, it's instead of, okay, four applications per year and we're going to mow every two weeks, maybe they pay, they offer, okay, pay us the same exact rate or maybe even extra, and we're going to do more scouting. We're going to do more targeted application approach. We're going to take a soil test to see if you need any of these other nutrients. We're going to uh, look at growth rate. And if you have a lawn that grows less and it's not irrigated, uh, okay, we're not going to mow it as much because that's unnecessarily uh, releasing carbon. you see carbon any of these businesses, Kale? You guys see any of these uh, progressive IPM lawn businesses popping up? Um, I don't, I, I, I think it's, it's a consumer education piece, right? And, yeah. and I think that's where it breaks down. I think there's genuine interest from some, some savvy you know, uh, individuals that are looking are forward thinking with where lawn care could go, and especially talking to these millennials and you know what mm -hmm. they want out of their lawn. Um, <laughs> I think that that has some potential, but it still just breaks down. Yeah, breaks down. I, I think it breaks down economically. People don't want to pay for somebody to have to drive out there all the time. I've seen one company do it, but it's a landscape management. It's not just the lawn. It typically involves the entire landscape. 
and there's ornamental plants that scouting and spot treating uh, can also make some sense. But yeah, I think it's a tough model. And I mean, I mean, right now the model is I get paid when I apply. I get paid when I mow. Yeah, so you, I'm you, not being invoice, paid, right? That's exactly right. So, all right, Carl. Kale, so great to have you, pal. And, and right. I love our text chats with that crew. Yeah, right? yeah. What a blast that is. Thanks for taking the time. Carl, get us out of here. Yep. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, we'll see you next week for a golf show uh, and a sports show. So we're looking to secure guests, uh, but we'll see you guys next week. Take care. Thanks, Cal. All see right. you, This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.